So uh, shifting gears, uh, actually downshifting back to basics, finding planets in the habitable zone. Um, so we probably have heard about the K2 mission, which is the repurposed Kepler spacecraft. So a couple years ago, Kepler lost two of its reaction wheels, which makes it unable to point steadily and significantly degrades the photometry that comes out of it. So we're trying to find transiting planets with K2, but the telescope is essentially uh, crippled in a sense. And so uh, this is what a typical planet hosting Kepler star looks like. Um, in this case, it's, I think it's an 11th magnitude Kepler band star with a hot Jupiter. Uh, this is a very similar star observed by K2, also 11th magnitude, also has transiting planets, and yet the data look terrible, the raw data. Uh, you could not by eye pick out any transits in this light curve. I think that might be one, but you can't be sure. And so detrending is a very important part of analyzing data with K2. And I just wanted to motivate a little bit of this. Why is the data so poor with K2? So the spacecraft can't point, fine, but you're still observing the star, and the star is still in your aperture, so aren't you collecting the same amount of flux? That would be true if you had a perfect detector, but in real life, um, detectors are not homogeneous in their sensitivity, and so actual quantum efficiency variations in the pixels and across the pixels um, translate to a change in the total flux you're receiving from the target that in the case of K2, where the drift occurs on very short time scales, uh, accompanied by, so, so the reason you have this jigsaw, or this jagged pattern, is that every six hours, the spacecraft fires a thruster to come back and point to the original field. When you convolve an uh, inhomogeneous detector with um, strong motion, you get a light curve that looks essentially like this. Now, this is just simulated data, but this is real K2 motion. And so an otherwise flat and featureless light curve, which may or may not have transits, uh, gets degraded in this fashion. And the problem at hand is we don't actually have this information about the pixel sensitivity in each pixel. All we get is this severely downgraded low resolution image of what the star is doing over time. And so what um, my pipeline does, uh, or actually, sorry, one slide before I get to that. Um, the question you might ask is why bother? We have um, spacecraft like TESS coming up online later this year um, that are gonna survey the entire sky and find tons of more habitable planets. Um, I want to make a pitch here for why K2 is still awesome. Um, this is to scale. So the, the actual collecting area of the Kepler spacecraft is still much larger than that of TESS. And so the potential noise floor for Kepler is still going to be the best out there for detecting these transiting planets in bulk. Uh, now TESS has awesome properties. It's gonna observe the whole sky. It's gonna do it at a much higher cadence. Um, but while we still have fuel for K2, we want to use it, and we want to continue to find habitable planets. And so what my pipeline does uh, is uh, to use a method called pixel level decorrelation. It's a machine learning model where you're actually using information at the pixel level, and you build up some large uh, matrix of regressors, and you do some linear algebra. And it's based on uh, stuff that Drake Deming has done for Spitzer. But basically, at the end of the day, I, I won't get into the math of this, you start with a light curve that looks like this, and at the end of the day, you actually recover um, the original Kepler precision for bright stars, which allows you to do um, very precise photometry and find transiting planets. Now, you can look back and see, in fact, that these are comparable precision at the same magnitude. And if you look at the distribution of magnitudes for stars detrended with Everest, which is the RK2 pipeline, um, you can see that the photometric precision as a function of magnitude follows a very similar distribution to that of the original Kepler mission before the reaction wheels failed. And so blue is K2 detrended with Everest, yellow is the original Kepler. Up until about magnitude 15, or 14 or 15, we recover original Kepler precision. Um, the science that's coming out of this, so this is work in preparation led by Ethan Kruse at University of Washington. Um, we are finding a lot more planets that have previously been missed by other pipelines. And in particular, uh, relevant to today's session, is that little region there, which is the habitable zone. Now these are, this is the very generous, optimistic habitable zone bounded by uh, Venus here and Mars here. And so we might be a little optimistic about these ones near the edge, but three of these points here are new and have not been found by previous pipelines. 
Um, if you're interested in planets outside the habitable zone, another cool thing that's coming out of this is we are finding tons of more multi-planet systems with our pipeline. Um, and so in total, uh, we expect something like 300 more K2 planets in the first eight campaigns, uh, several multis, and three to four new small habitable zone planets coming soon. This is a little family portrait of the four. This one is slightly outside the habitable zone. We're hoping that revised stellar parameters might actually scatter it in. Uh, it would be very cool. Um, I wanted to, so this is very recent stuff. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but um, since K2 observed TRAPPIST-1, I think this is the perfect time to talk about the habitable planets in, or the potentially habitable planets in TRAPPIST. Um, now, many of you know TRAPPIST-1, seven uh, transiting planets, uh, two nature papers earlier this year and last year. Um, K2 observed the TRAPPIST-1 system recently, and this is the raw light curve. Um, you can see some uh, modulation due to star spots. You can see some low-laying outliers. They could be transits. They could just be noise. After you detrend this light curve, um, it is much clearer. And in fact, almost all of these points below the continuum are transits, and almost all of these points above the continuum are flares. And so this star is either there's either a transit or a flare happening about 20% of the time. This is the richest data set we know of for um, exoplanet transits. And so it's very, we're very lucky to have been able to play with this with K2. Here's a family portrait of the six, um, the first six TRAPPIST planets. Um, this is seen in K2, short cadence, detrended with Everest. Um, this is the longest baseline uh, light curve we have of the system so far, just because K2 stared at it almost uninterruptedly for, um, for 80 days. Um, and so we, we can do, uh, we're still working on transit timing variations. You can use these to constrain the masses very well. There's actually a paper in the archive doing this. Um, we think we can revise the masses a little better, but there's very cool stuff coming out of this data, uh, out of this data set. Um, here are the habitable zone planets, E, F, and G are in the uh, conservative habitable zone. D is a little near the edge, perhaps uncomfortably so. Um, and um, I'm missing H from that diagram, and that's because, um, so in our paper from uh, last month that we put in archive, uh, we use K2 to confirm H and detect its period. Um, and here is the raw data, um, and you can see that after successive detrending, the transit appears. Um, you would not have been able to see that from the, from the raw light curve. And so here is the folded um, light curve on the four transits of H that we detected. Um, this planet, so the reason I'm putting this slide up here is because H is smaller than the Earth, and it's farther, it's outside the habitable zone, beyond the habitable zone, and yet K2 can still detect it. And so K2, because of its, uh, if you detrend it properly, just because of its awesome collecting power, is still a great observatory for detecting planets in the habitable zone, especially small ones. Um, and uh, we have fuel left on the spacecraft, and so we should continue to do that. Um, and I just wanted to conclude uh, very briefly with um, some links here. So the Everest pipeline is open source. Um, you can check it out on GitHub, or you can pip install it if you use Python. Uh, and you can check out our papers here. Um, we are going to continue detrending all the campaigns for K2 um, as long as the spacecraft, spacecraft has fuel. And uh, uh, keep an eye out for our paper with the, with the new habitable zone planets. So thank you. All right, we have time for some questions. If you're able, please come up to the uh, microphone. Not telescope, wrong word. Oh. Uh, that was great. Um, do you have stellar information for those uh, habitable zone planets? Um, <laughs> what do you mean by stellar information? What kind of stars? Oh, so one is an M, and I think the other three are K. Uh, are these the new ones? Yeah, the, the new K ones. Yeah. The uh, maybe they're early M. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. I'd have to ask Ethan. But okay. I can get back to you. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> can you say anything about the flaring on TRAPPIST-1 from the K2 light curve? Yes. So uh, we have a paper in preparation on that. 
I'm not leading that, but um, um, I can't remember the flaring rate off the top of my head. Um, what can we say? So, so based on the flaring and the and the rotation period, which is three days, um, it's consistent. All, all we can say in the paper, at least, is that it's consistent with a middle-aged um, late M dwarf. Um, I don't know what what exactly they're working on in the flare modeling right now. But thank you. Hi, John Grunsfeld, NASA. Have you thought at all about contemporaneous uh, parallel observations with K2 and TESS to try and you know, help test commission essentially, or what you know what you could learn, you know, with your greater sensitivity, you know, so that you know tests can start discovering faster. That's a great idea. No, I had not thought about that. Um, yeah, that's a good question for the for the Kepler team. Um, yeah, something to think about. Thank you. All right, let's give Rodrigo another round of applause.